Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Oh, yep, and the attendees are coming in now. Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for joining us. Okay, we'll just give uh, about uh, five minutes or so for all the attendees to slowly join in. Hi, welcome. Hi, welcome, everyone. Uh, putting up on the program itself for the agenda of the day for everyone's reference. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Okay, we'll let a few more in. Let's see more in so far, 42. Okay, we'll be beginning in another three more minutes. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, everyone. Uh, okay, I have a few housekeeping notes for everyone. It'll be in the chat. So for everyone to notice, uh, this entire session will be recorded. And after the recording, uh, it will be made available on the YouTube channel of International Movement for Just World for everyone uh, to view and also share with your friends. And for any questions that you have, uh, please use the Q&A feature provided on the Zoom platform when also uh, answering your questions. Please uh, keep it succinct and courteous as well. And as fair warning to anyone, any abusive language or comments will also result in the move. So we encourage civil discussions in this webinar platform for everyone to, who is attending. For the uh, panelists, please keep your mics muted uh, unless when you want to speak, just to minimize any interruptions and noises as well. So to everyone, thank you for your cooperation. It will be beginning in two more minutes. Okay, so once more, welcome everyone to the webinar, Humanity's Future. Uh, this is a webinar that was born from the call and petition. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with uh, in regards to the initiators of Professor Richard Fall, of Pro Joseph Camilleri and Dr. Chandra. Um, I would like to welcome everyone. And as again, there are many opportunities for us to actually have a long discussion about what the topic of the call was and also about what is it that we want to draw from the call itself. Now, I'm not going to take much more time and I would like to actually pass the floor to our moderator today, Dr. Ivana Nikolic Hughes, who is the president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and a senior lecturer in chemistry on Columbia University. 
uh, Ivana, the floor is yours to conduct. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hasanal, and thank you really for everything you have done uh, to make not just this event possible, but this uh, his, uh, historic call uh, and, and momentous um, event. Um, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, or just a big and warm hello from New York City. Uh, as Hasanal said, my name is Ivana Nikolic Hughes, uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome everyone uh, to this event where we will be discussing nothing more and nothing less uh, than humanity's future. Um, opening one's email is rarely, I think, uh, an occasion uh, of joy. Uh, sometimes we experience that kind of joy when we get a note from an old friend or um, in my case, a former student who might uh, have perhaps years later decided to write a, a, a thank you uh, no, sometimes a problem gets resolved, uh, usually not, uh, that, that we didn't anticipate would get resolved. But I experienced truly a moment of joy opening up my email <clears throat> on August 27th in the morning. It arrived, uh, my, my time, it was a Saturday morning. It arrived in my email at 5.12 a.m. And I don't remember exactly when I woke up, but I wake up early, usually between five and six. And I remember opening up um, a kind of empty email box because nobody else had emailed me very early on the Saturday morning uh, and seeing a note from Hassanal uh, and um, just reading the email initially, um, asking for my endorsement of the call and then reading the call and just being truly overwhelmed uh, with a feeling of joy that here it was, uh, it was being said, uh, all of it was being said, all that had been on my mind, all that I had been um, worried and, and concerned about. Um, and the call has this, um, it has both a, um, an element of uh, uh, just the, the kind of fear and, and, and challenge that we are experiencing in this moment, but at the same time, a kind of hopeful approach um, that truly we can uh, get through these problems, but once we do, we also have to take care of uh, humanity, we have to take care of our planet, and we have to truly, truly, truly uh, come together. Um, I know that everyone on, on this call at, at this event has read the call, and I uh, certainly hope uh, has endorsed it as well and signed the petition. Uh, and I and we will be hearing from the authors. We'll be uh, hearing from our three authors and three discussants, and I'll talk about them in just a moment. Um, but I do want to sort of emphasize a couple of features of the call uh, that I just think are so important. And I'm just going to read the first sentence um, uh, or the first two sentences. Humanity has reached a tipping point. It is time for governments international institutions and people everywhere to take stock and act with renewed urgency. I think for me, this was, it, it was clear that we were really um, on the right path. I'll, I'll point out a couple of the features. The call um, discusses the, the toxic relationship between the United States on the one hand and China and Russia on the other. Um, the, the moment in which we're in where the global power shift is in fact taking place, but it really just this um, uh, renewed emphasis on a need for a multi-centric, uh, multi-civilizational world. Um, the call also quotes from what has truly become one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, speeches, uh, and certainly one of my favorite recent speeches, and it is the speech by um, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, um, Antonio Guterres. I actually was at the UN uh, for this speech. Uh, this was on August 1st, the opening day of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Treaty's 10th Review Conference. Um, and uh, the call uh, quotes, um, Secretary General is saying humanity's one misunderstanding, one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. 
uh, Secretary General continued to say that luck is not a strategy. And so I'm uh, truly delighted that the call among other um, concrete steps um, uh, uh, pushes for a, um, uh, a specified time frame to universal membership of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It is truly, it is remarkable that we now have um, an international instrument that bans nuclear weapons, bans their existence, their use, their uh, threat of use, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and we truly must um, uh, see that uh, treaty uh, to its full um, implementation. Um, I'll, I'll point out a couple of other things about the call um, and then open it up to, to our first our authors um, and then our discussants. Um, the call um, uh, has, of course, starts with the notion of the toxic relationship um, that fully it's one thing when there's a, a toxic relationship um, that affects just somehow, and that's really never the case, even in interpersonal relationships, but toxic relationships um, affect others. In this case, truly the, the toxic relationship uh, between the United States and, and Russia and China, on the other hand, uh, are affected, uh, affecting the entire world. And so, of course, uh, a large focus um, of the call is on ending the conflict in Ukraine, and on diffusing the tensions in Taiwan. Um, the call to end the conflict in Ukraine also contains um, some very specific steps um, of how that should happen. Uh, do we have a way of muting maybe somebody? Um, and, then, and then finally, the call does, um, besides these short-term short initiatives, um, that are needed um, to address the, the current geopolitical tensions, um, the call does have um, a um, series of other uh, longer term steps, um, including um, a culmination in an international conference that I uh, truly hope uh, uh, will be able to, um, uh, to take place. Um, so, Again, back to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, one of the, uh, the, the, the first step is the stopping the march to nuclear oblivion. And then we continue on uh, with also aspirational um, steps uh, uh, for common cooperative and comprehensive security um, and um, really addressing um, the um, uh, the prevalence of militarization of the international system um, and um, aiming uh, to reduce uh, both the reach and the scope of military alliances um, and uh, use of military force. And that, of course, includes the reduction in military budgets. Um, I am going to uh, just make one more remark um, and then um, introduce Richard Falk. Um, the call does this really wonderful job um, at not only laying out the steps, but also laying out who it is um, that is being called upon. And so I was delighted to see um, the way in which um, the call is addressed to people of all kinds of backgrounds um, and as well as uh, groups working on a lot of different issues. I think this is um, uh, something that is absolutely critical in this moment that people come together. You cannot just solve climate change if at the same time, or, or if at some point we end up in nuclear war, you cannot just, um, you cannot address so many human rights issues um, if uh, in fact uh, our uh, uh, government budgets um, are heavily used um, towards military, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna stop here um, and um, now just lay out um, that our program is um, to hear from our authors, uh, professors Richard Falk, uh, Professor Chandra Muzaffar, and Professor Joseph Camilleri. 
And then we will hear from our discussants, um, Professor Chaiwad Sata Anan, um, uh, Susan Abu Hava, and Victoria Britton. Um, and um, after that, we will have time for discussion um, both um, amongst uh, our panelists as well as uh, with our audience. So this is um, what Hassanal um, uh, has already described. You'll be able to post your uh, questions in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen, um, and we will try to have as many of the questions addressed and answered. And now it's truly um, a, a special delight to introduce Richard Falk. Um, uh, Richard um, uh, perhaps doesn't need uh, an introduction uh, to this audience, uh, but I will say just a few words. Uh, he's uh, truly a leading international law professor, a prominent activist, a prolific author. I've read so far just two of his books, uh, and um, I've learned so much. Uh, and and uh, well, after today's session, I'm going to have a very long reading list. So, um, uh, uh, but but Richard, during his 40 years at Princeton, uh, was active in seeking an end to the Vietnam War. Uh, he was asking. Uh, he was active in seeking a better understanding of Iran, a just solution for Israel and Palestine, and really. Um, improve democracy um, elsewhere. He served as a UN Special Rapporteur uh, for Occupied Palestine, and in 2010 was named Outstanding Public Scholar in Political Economy by the International Studies Association. For me personally, it, in just a matter of months, um, I've uh, and I haven't met Richard in person yet, although I will in in early November in Santa Barbara when he's back. Uh, but in just a few months, he has truly become um, a dear friend and a personal mentor. So I'm absolutely delighted um, to introduce Richard and to ask him to give us um, some uh, context for the rising dangers. Uh, presently confronting the world. Uh, Richard, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Ivana, for that gracious uh, introduction and uh, all that you've done to uh, make gatherings like this possible. Uh, and I should say uh, it's uh, difficult to uh, reduce uh, the complexity of these, uh, the challenges we all face uh, into five minutes. And so I've done what I rarely do and tried to put down on paper some uh, brief thoughts. Uh, but I should emphasize at the outset that uh, this whole call initiative has been a very, uh, very much of a collective effort with the uh, energy flowing from the global south, which I think is part of the uh, hopeful side of the uh, transformative potential that all of us uh, need to exert our energies to make actual. Uh, I, I'm only going to try to make uh, two kinds of points that I think don't flow from the call, but are not exactly uh, uh, expressed in it. Uh, the first is the that the Ukraine uh, crisis not only signifies a flare-up of a new Cold War that has brought to the surface nuclear dangers associated both with weaponry and nuclear energy reactors. The gravity of this situation is accentuated by the geopolitical irresponsibility of both Moscow and Washington. And strangely, the only apparent adult in the global, uh, in the geopolitical domain seems to be China. 
Putin's raising the short-term ante by nuclear threats, Biden responding by an, imp uh, by an incomprehensible call for continuing the war uh, as long as it takes to achieve victory for Ukraine and defeat for Russia. This is a severe example of a common deficiency in world order, what I would characterize as geopolitical myopia or nearsightedness with scant sensitivity to the catastrophic risks that are entailed. There were alternatives before 2022 and since the Russian attack on February 24th uh, to choose a different way of proceeding on both sides. Even more so than during the first Cold War, humanity faces the prospects both of nuclear winter and irreversible ecological harm that could make uh, planet Earth essentially uninhabitable in, in the near future. This, this combination of realities uh, is really something that the uh, world has not faced in the, in the uh, in the past ever. And in that sense, we are at a unique tipping point in uh, human history uh, that we must really uh, address if we are to uh, survive and flourish as a species uh, in the coming uh, decades. Uh, we, we, we also are sensitive to the fact that this uh, first call, first uh, Cold War humanity faces issues that were not confronted directly uh, earlier, such as nuclear winter, and the irreversible uh, threat to ecological stability. Uh, the upcoming 27, uh, COP27 climate change meeting in Cairo is uh, likely to be a carnival of resounding words and empty gestures. We cannot re realistically expect anything better while the uh, political imagination of leaders of dominant countries are preoccupied with the politics of geopolitical realignment. The current situation is further shadowed by the lingering experience of the of COVID-19 pandemic and its demonstration that the world is still fragmented economically, politically, and emotionally when it comes to sharing a common danger. The second thing I want to uh, just briefly allude to is what I call the biological, ecological, economic, ethical, political, uh, spiritual, unprecedented, multi-dimensional challenge. Humanity is confronted by this unprecedented challenge of global scale uh, to uh, a sustainable and just global governance structure. And this is against this back foreground of uh, inflammatory uh, behavior on the part of leading uh, countries. The resulting governance, sustainability, and survival crises should be being addressed uh, in, in such a way as a, 
an acknowledgement of an emergency that requires the necessary resources and energy to find adaptive solutions. Constructive transformative responses can be considered only, I believe, at the present time under the banner of a politics of impossibility with hope sustained by the awareness that within the last century, the impossible has actually happened rather frequently, surprising experts, politicians, and the public. Reduced to its end time reality, this sense of the human condition that has not in modern times been confronted can best be characterized as one of species extinction. Such is the ultimate risk of this new age that scientists and others have labeled the anthropocentric. A due recognition of the systemic leverage now exerted by the human species for better and for worse on the destiny of the planet and its human and non-human inhabitants. So we are facing an endangered planet and its all its inhabitants at a time of short-term disastrous catastrophic risks being taken. And it is in that spirit that this call has been launched and the hope for a community of solidarity in meeting the challenge uh, is our uh, deepest aspiration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard. And, um, thank you for reminding us that the cooperation is so crucial and critical, not only because we want to avoid the worst, but also because we need to cooperate to truly deal with the um, existing problems of biodiversity loss, of climate change, of present and future uh, future pandemics. Thank you so much. I'm just going to interject and, and make one comment because uh, you mentioned the Anthropocene. Scientists understand that going into the future, and hopefully there is such a thing as a future, and 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 future scientists who will study uh, this period. Um, the expectation is that um, what future scientists would look for in the rocks is a plutonium-239 um, line. Um, so the, the basically the fallout from nuclear testing over the decades uh, that spread um, uh, plutonium and other radioactive isotopes around the globe will in fact show up in our um, in our rocks, in our geology. And so the Anthropocene and, and nuclear weapons are um, uh, intimately intertwined. It is now um, a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Chandra Muzaffar, who is the president of the International Movement for a Just World, or JUST, um, an international um, non-governmental uh, organization based in Malaysia which seeks to critique global injustice and to develop an alternative vision of a just and compassionate civilization guided by universal spiritual and moral values. Professor Muzaffar has published extensively on civilizational dialogue, international politics, religion, human rights, and Malaysian society. He's the author and editor of 32 books in English and Malay, and many of his writings have been translated into other languages. He was professor and director of the Center for Civilizational Dialogue at the University of Malaya and professor of global studies at the University of San Malaysia. Um, uh, professor um, Muzaffar, the floor is yours uh, to tell us um, a little bit of, on why and how the call came about. Thank you, Dr. Ivana. Moderator, fellow panelists, discussants, friends, peace be with you. I'd like to begin 
by explaining the background to this call. Richard, Joe and I have been close friends for more than 30 years. We have taken common positions on a variety of courses. We are all linked directly or indirectly with this movement called the International Movement for a Just World. Now, when Ukraine happened, we exchanged our writings, we communicated with one another, and we decided as the situation became more and more dire that we should draft a statement, a common position on the crisis. And that's how this statement was drafted and after some discussions within our group, we decided to circulate it to a number of friends. Of the friends that we circulated it to, 45 of them decided to endorse the call. Not a single one rejected it. Now this call, endorsed by these individuals became the basis of our campaign. Now of the 45 individuals, if one may mention this here, we had uh, people like the Nobel Peace Laureate, Merit McGuire, and public in intellectuals like uh, Jeffrey Sachs, Noam Chomsky, Kishore Mehubamani, Sulak Sivaraksa, Mahmoud Mamdani, and others. If I don't mention the other names, it's simply because time doesn't permit, but these are all notable figures, outstanding individuals who have been committed to the public wheel. Now, after we got the support of these 45 endorsers, we decided to make the document public. We put it up on a platform called change.org, which is a very well-known platform for petitions and um, activities of that sort. After a month, we now have something like 2,754 endorsers from all walks of life in addition, of course, to the initial 45. These endorsers come from more than 45 countries. Of course, if you compare the number to the whole human family, it is just a drop in the ocean. But nonetheless, these are conscious, committed individuals We've decided to come forward. And for a document of this sort, the response has been quite encouraging. Now this webinar, friends, is being held not only to strengthen the voices of all those who are opposed to the war in Ukraine from different parts of the world, this webinar is being held to obtain feedback from all of you on what we should do next, as far as this call is concerned. How should we move forward? We need your ideas, we need your contributions. We are convinced, friends, that we'll only be able to move forward if we address the underlying causes of the crisis that confronts humankind. We cannot avoid this. We must deal with the underlying causes. And you will see from our document, the call to humanity, that we are convinced that this is happening partly because of this shift in the global power structure. 
a nation and its allies who have been so dominant for so long. That nation and its allies know that they are losing grip, that the other centers of power that emerge, they are being challenged, notably the challenge from China and Russia, did not want this change to happen. Which is why if you look at what had happened in the last few weeks, it was not just Ukraine. It was no coincidence that right in the midst of the Ukraine crisis, there were tensions over Taiwan. Engineered, manipulated tensions over Taiwan. It was a message. We know that this is the challenge facing all of us. I think it's so important for people everywhere to realize this that the hegemony, the dominance and control exercised by the United States and its allies at this point in history is a threat to humankind. Because they will do all that is within their power and outside their power to ensure that they remain on top forever. And there will be reactions to this. And the reactions will lead to wars and tensions. This is why I think the ultimate analysis is the people who will have to stand up. People everywhere and say, look, we don't want this sort of hegemonic pattern in international relations. We'd like to work towards a different pattern in international relations, which is in the interests of humankind. And we must be very clear about this, that it's not just the US and its allies as the hegemonic center at this stage in history, that is our concern. Any other hegemony, any other hegemon, any other pattern of hegemony that emerges in the future should also be resisted by people everywhere because hegemony in the ultimate analysis is a negation, a repudiation of our humanity, of our common humanity. It denies the rights of people to shape their own future, to de determine their own path, their own destiny. Hegemony is bad because it has to be supported by military power and by a distorted economy that favors a small group of individuals and a small number of nations. There's no other way in which you can perpetuate it. Which is why I think people must stand up because it is in their interest to stand up. It is a tall order. It's a very big struggle. But unless groups and individuals everywhere make their feelings known, their voices heard, I do not see how we can stop this. Because we are depending upon nation states and the existing structure, including the United Nations, to address this challenge is going to be difficult because they are in a sense a product of this pattern of power. And even if they try to make some changes here and there, it would be minimal. We need something more fundamental and is that fundamental challenge that we have to confront. I mentioned Germany largely in terms of Ukraine and Taiwan and wars and tensions, but there are also other dimensions to Germany, the economic dimension. Germany has led to an economic system which concentrates wealth in the hands of a few people. And the gap between the rich and poor has become wider than ever before. Hegemony also promotes a certain notion of lifestyle, of values, which may not be shared by the vast majority of you, because it is not in their interest. Hegemony undermines the spiritual basis of the existence of the human family. This is why, friends, we'll have to decide on how we are going to move forward 
all of us and others who are not part of this effort, who will be able to make great contributions, I have no doubt. This is the challenge before all of us. It is a challenge before all of us because we are convinced the initiators of this um, call and others who have endorsed this call, we are convinced that if we continue this way, we will leave behind a world for our children and grandchildren that would be an utter disgrace. Wars, tensions, economic inequalities, social inequalities, cultural malaise, this is not what we want. This is why, friends, we have to stand up and we have to respond to this in a challenge. What is the sort of world we want? It is hinted in our document. It is a multi-civilizational, multi-polar world that we seek, where justice prevails in the relations between nations and within nations. It's equally important within nations. We want a world where the dignity of each and every human being the dignity of the whole of creation is the ultimate mark of our success. Let us work towards that. This is a call from a small number of people, but it is a call which we believe resonates with the sentiments, the feelings, the emotions of a lot of human beings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Muzaffar, uh, for those uh, sobering remarks. Um, it is indeed a tall order, uh, and, and this call is just the, the start, but I think we truly owe it to future generations. We cannot, um, it's, it's really two options with the status quo. It's either the world that you described, or it's even worse. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's no world at all. Um, and so uh, this, uh, this must uh, move forward. And we now precisely have remarks from uh, Professor Joseph Camilleri um, to tell us exactly uh, about the road ahead. And I'm just gonna introduce him briefly. Uh, Professor Camilleri was born into a Maltese family residing in Egypt and his family uh, moved to Australia, so truly somebody with a with an international outlook. Um, he was uh, both educated and and taught in both Australia and England. Um, he is currently a professor of international relations uh, uh, at La Trobe University, where he holds personal chair in politics in the School of Social Sciences. He's also the director of the Center for Dialogue at La Trobe. Um, Professor uh, Camilleri uh, is a member of the Australian Committee of the Council for Security and Cooperation in Asia Pacific, a member of the advisory board of the scholarly journal Global Governance, and member of the advisory council uh, of the Tode Institute for Peace and Global Policy Research. Uh, Professor Camilleri, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan. It's a pleasure. Uh, to uh, be part of this initiative and uh, to ask what drives it. I think we've already heard from our two previous uh, speakers. It's the urgency of the moment. Uh, it's a call, if you will, for a rethink, a drastic rethink, how we see things and how we do things. And uh, the need, the critical need, uh, requires immediate steps but these have to be placed within a larger framework, uh, a longer term imperative, which I think as uh, has already been said, is to reshape the global security discourse and the management of global security. The key issue then is uh, how to manage the power shift that's happening, and in particular, the civilizational shift. It's not any kind of power shift, 
There have been several of those uh, in centuries past, but there hasn't been a civilizational shift as the one that is now going on from west to east quite in this way for many centuries. And this shift, which can be destabilizing, is happening at a time of the combined threat posed by nuclear weapons, climate change, pandemics, uh, stark inequalities, and much else. Now, in an ideal world, we would be looking to governments, to international institutions, the UN, media, to be part of the solution. Sadly, they are part of the problem. And so that places the onus on civil society. There's a crying need for thoughtful voices of civil society to make themselves heard in a way that makes a difference. It's not enough to be heard. We have to be heard in a way that makes a difference. And the measure, the yardstick, is to be heard in a way that compels governments, international institutions, and the media to sit up and take notice. And so we need a re-energized civil society, alive to the dangers, but also alive to the opportunities before us. And for this, I think, and this is really what the call is aspiring to, or hoping for, we need to widen and deepen the public conversation on global security, understood both as human security and ecological security. And the question then is, for the road ahead, what kind of conversation should this be? And I want to spell out, if you like, half a dozen key features of the conversation we need to establish in the months and years ahead. First, a conversation that engages in sustained fashion, not occasionally, a much larger number of people than is presently the case. Scale has to be achieved, and that is critically important. Numbers count a great deal. It has to be a conversation that's conducted in multiple places. Let's be clear as to what that involves, in person and online, in small and large groups, formally and informally, through the spoken word, through the arts, through sport, where we live, where we work, where we study, play, pray, conduct the business of everyday life, all facets of human life have to somehow be connected to the conversation we so desperately need. It has to be a conversation, secondly, that goes deeper, that looks squarely at our predicament. If we're looking at the con Ukraine conflict, for example, what is it? It's not a war between Russia and the Ukraine. That's its outer manifestation. It is fundamentally a confrontation between the two nuclear superpowers of the world today, the United States and Russia. So it's got to be a conversation that delves into the causes and the likely consequences of our predicament should we neglect to take timely remedial action. Thirdly, it has to be a conversation that connects issues and connects people beavering away on different issues and often, sadly, operating in silos, whether it be, for example, climate change or homelessness or drug addiction or nuclear weapons. Uh, it has to be a holistic approach and a community building conversation. Next, it has to be a sustained conversation that connects people in different sectors, that connects educators and intellectuals with artists, health workers, architects and town planners, scientists, of course, trade unions, business groups, professional associations, religious communities, and more. This conversation doesn't grow on trees. It has to be planned and worked for systematically across the globe. It has to be a conversation understood as a dialogue, conducted across boundaries, 
the boundaries that separate nations, languages, cultures, and belief systems. This has to be a dialogue of reflective, what I call reflective communication, but also a dialogue of experience, of shared experiences, and a dialogue of action, and wherever possible, collaborative, educative action. We have already in our group discussed some possibilities, uh, but we are, of course, a long way from uh, uh, in any way crystallizing them concretely. Uh, and that's why we're keen to hear from everyone. Uh, we have a call that has, uh, as uh, Dr. Chandra has told us, uh, had already 2,750 endorsements. Uh, we are beginning to think of a notional target, perhaps of 5,000 uh, in a month's time. It may be ambitious, uh, but worth trying for. Uh, that doesn't happen uh, automatically. It requires a fair amount of energy on the part of a good number of people uh, to get us to that point. Uh, so what we need is a conversation that makes full use of the spoken word, um, of course, we, we can have further webinars, that's not a problem, but there's also Zoom fatigue. Uh, we can consider podcasts and uh, uh, not just uh, podcasts of straight talks, but interviews, conversation, all that's possible. And we need to think, of course, of the written work, of short articles, opinion pieces, information sheets, uh, and uh, contributions to the media, small independent media perhaps, uh, and uh, an effort to break into mainstream media. And needless to say, the use of digital media. We have been speaking about the possibility of creating an interactive, an interactive website uh, that might create opportunities for the exchange of views, ideas, information, proposals, experiences, uh, similarly with social media. Uh, but, and a thought just of mine to add to this, we can't rely just on the use of English language. A conscious effort is needed to communicate in both written and the spoken word in at least a few other languages. The call itself may be uh, amenable uh, to translation in at least a few carefully selected languages. There may be value in establishing some regional groups uh, that would meet online with a view to getting initiatives or projects off the ground that take account of regional local interests and at the same time fit into the global security paradigm encapsulated by the call. I should say that uh, speaking for myself, the, the, the plan is not to create so much an organization of our own, but rather an ongoing network of committed people, individuals, groups, and organizations who can see the value of dialogue and collaborative action uh, with a simple goal, a human-centered, ecologically sustainable approach uh, to global security. So all we've done so far is to toss a small pebble into a large pond. Uh, our hope is uh, that it will have ripple effects that will combine with others to create a powerful current that has some prospect of safeguarding humanities and of course the planet's future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Camilleri, um, uh, for the inspiring marks about the road ahead. Uh, it is so important that uh, voices of ordinary people be heard and that uh, ordinary people be engaged and involved. Um, in the United States, I was in a meeting yesterday um, and uh, Cynthia Lazaroff, who is really an expert on US-Russia relations, said um, that peace uh, in the United States has become a dirty word. You say the word peace and somehow you are immediately a Putin apologist or, or, or worse. Uh, and so uh, we do need to embrace um, a call for peace um, first and foremost and, and then proceed with the road ahead. So thank you so much for that. We now have, we have three discussants um, 
Uh, and uh, I'm uh, delighted to introduce first uh, Professor Chaiwat uh, Satanand, uh, who is an expert at the Toda Peace Institute and a professor of political science at Tamasat University. Um, he is um, in Bangkok. Uh, he's also the founder and director of the Thai Peace Information Center, which conducts studies and activism in relation to the Thai military and social issues. He is also the chairperson of the Strategic Nonviolence Commission in Thailand um, and an expert on nonviolence theory and activism, as well as on Islam. Uh, Professor Satanan, the uh, floor is yours. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Imana and uh, friends. Peace be with you all. My response to the three excellent and thought-provoking presentations by three wonderful friends, Richard Falk, Joe Camilleri, and Chandra Musafa, could be encapsulated in, in, in a single number. And that number is 312. Um, but where does this number come from? 312 is the combined age of four old men before you myself included. A question could immediately be raised, how could four men and not a single woman speaker uh, with a combined age of 312 years talk about the future of humanity, knowing well that it is the younger generations with all kinds of differences who will inherit the earth. And that's my critique of what's happening. I will, however, use the number 312 to ponder three elements I consider crucial for any meaningful meditation of humanity's future. There are three crucial themes endangering the world, some of which Richard had talked about, and Ivana too. One solution suggested in a possible journey to mitigate the awful consequences of the three dangerous issues, and two inspirations drawn from the teachings of Buddhism and civilization in order to enhance our civilizational uh, uh, sensitivity as reliable companions in fostering prefer humanity's future. The first number three, there are three elements, remilitarization, dangerous DNA, and property without rights to exist. Remilitarization, uh, February 24th, 2022, marked the beginning of a return to a most dangerous global trend. Yes, um, uh, uh, world hegemony, uh, uh, situation underlying cause, but what is happening in my view is remilitarization of the world. Nowhere was this more evident than in the German Bundestag, three days after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, when Olaf Scholz announced Germany's decision to supply weapons to Kiev, to support a wide range of sanctions against Russia, and to boost German defense spending. This is historical, uh, uh, because in Germany, you are not supposed to export arms to war zones, maintain defense budget below 2% of GDP, nor allow third countries to send German-made arms to deadly conflict areas. Charles argues that Putin was not only invading a country, but is destroying the European security structure. As the war dragged on for more than eight months with the European human atrocities daily displayed, and its impact on global climate change due to its fossil fuel dependence not known, it has become a marketplace of death by so many weapons producers, showcasing modern and highly advanced instruments of destruction designed for no other purposes but to take sacred human rights, human lives. Second point, dangerous DNA. One of the dire consequences of the present remilitarizing moment is to accentuate existing dangerous DNA in international organization originally designed to be a military and security pact. NATO is a political and military alliance with a built-in integrated military command structure. Born inside the bosom of the Cold War, its DNA has been to fight against its sworn enemy, the Warsaw Pact, the communist Warsaw Pact. But after Cold War ended in the early 1990s and the Warsaw Pact gone, the organization could be seen as suffering from a lost sense of meaning and a chronic disease called enemy deprivation syndrome. Enemy deprivation syndrome, you cannot live without enemy. Its military pact DNA dictates that such an organization could not rigorously exist without enemy. Consider its sister organization in Southeast Asia, CETO. 
Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, many security specialists consider the organization a failure, especially after the American lost the Vietnam War. But I would argue that one of the most remarkable Southeast Asian wisdoms on living together in a new historical moment was to just let Sito die its natural death. As a result, Southeast Asia was left with a free space where former enemies such as Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia on one hand and Philippines, Thailand on the other could be invited to join in a new non-military organization, ASEAN, as friends. Obviously not without some weaknesses, but ASEAN was not born with a flawed DNA dictating that to exist, it must have enemies. Third issue, property without rights to exist. Perhaps the most telling evidence of how far the present remilitarization moment would go in jeopardizing the world occurred in Birmingham on August 23rd, 2022. When Liz Truss, the then British future prime minister declared that she would launch a nuclear strike on Russia, even though the result would, would be global annihilation. Listening to her emotionless expression, one cannot help but ask by what authority, this sounds biblical, does a British prime minister or anyone else have to entitle him or her to annihilate the world? I would also argue that such weapons of mass destruction do not have a right to exist. In the field of nonviolent action, there's a healthy debate on the issue of property damage. According to the Catholic Berrigan brothers, some property has no right to exist, and therefore damage done to this type of property is considered nonviolent action. According to 1986 War Resistance League Organizers Manual, examples of property with no right to exist include nuclear weapons, napalm, electric chairs, or ovens in Hitler's concentration camp. Now, those are the three critical issues within the remilitarizing world, remilitarizing moment. Now, one solution. A decade ago, in the future of power, the eminent Joseph Nye argues eloquently that the future of power is a matter of whose story wins. We need a very good story to tell the world, and that would help us, I mean all of us, young and old, with all beautiful differences, walk towards the future without fear and to look back at our own past without despair. And we are lucky to have with us the Palestinian novelists to help us perhaps think about such a story. Last point, two inspirations, Buddhism, friend in suffering and Islam's neighbor. Friend is not suffering. More than any other religions, perhaps Buddhism underscores the fact that human life cycle with birth, getting old, sickness, and death is suffering. For the enlightened one, Buddhist wisdom suggests a life of understanding the world of impermanence through the language and thought of detachment. But for ordinary people like us, without the blessing of such wisdom, how are we to live? Buddhism inspires us to live with others as friend in suffering. The underlying word is friend, friend in suffering. The important Buddhist message here is that Friend in suffering consoles us with the fact that we are never alone in such misery. At times, caring for the suffering others would invigorate us to make our own lives for suffering more bearable and meaningful. Now from Islam. Inspiration from Islam come from how we treat neighbors. Listening to how Prophet Muhammad advised Muslims to treat their neighbors can be exhilarating. He said, and I quote, do you know what the rights of a neighbor, Muslim and non-Muslim alike are? Help him if he asks your help. Give him relief if he seeks your relief. Lend him if he needs loan. Show him concern if he is distressed. Nurse him when he is ill. Attend his funeral if he dies. Congratulate him if he meets any good. Sympathize with him if any calamity befalls him. Do not block his heir by raising your building high without his permission. Imagine that. Harass him not, give him a share when you buy fruits. And if you do not give him, bring your buys right to your house quietly and let not your children take them out to excite the anger of his children. This is the care to which a Muslim needs to have to his own neighbors, to link the neighbor. And this is, why is this important? Because Richard and Joe and, and Jantra was talking about the, the, the possibility of building a community of civilizing the community of, of the 
uh, unpacking this hegemonic unfair world. Now, with a sense of tragic optimism where a series of little improvement counts, there is no human struggle more noble at this time than to break free from the chains of despair and begin a new journey of hope inspired by the discussions we have just become a part of. And I, for one, am very proud to be a part of this friendship. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sathanan, um, for, for your really incisive comments about the call, but also these um, absolutely inspiring remarks about Buddhism and, and, and the quotes um, uh, about Islam. Um, on how um, we should all treat our neighbors. And um, I'm delighted now to introduce Susan Abulhava, um, who is also one of our discussants. Uh, she is a Palestinian American writer and human rights activist and author of several books and the founder of a non-governmental organization, Playgrounds for Palestine. Uh, she lives in Pennsylvania. Her first novel, Mornings in Jenin, uh, was translated into 32 languages and sold more than a million copies. And um, her other books are entitled The Blue Between Sky and Water, um, and against the loveless world. Um, Susan, uh, thank you so much for, for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you, Ivana, for uh, that kind introduction. And um, I am uh, grateful for the knowledge, um, the experience and wisdom imparted by the panelists and, and uh, discussants thus far. And, uh, and thank you for including me in this important conversation. Uh, it has only been 77 years since the United States launched two nuclear attacks on Japan in the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the horrors of those atomic bombs are thus still in living memory. Although the United States is the only country to ever use such a weapon of mass destruction against civilians in whole cities, there have been other terrible consequences of nuclear warfare technology. In my lifetime, the explosion of the Chernobyl reactor, for example, was a reminder of what nuclear death uh, looks like and how far reaching it can be. So it is right to be concerned about nuclear annihilation. But I also think the fear of nuclear war is somewhat myopic and limited because it keeps us from recognizing the alarming advances in death and suppression technologies that are already being used and actually normalized. And the even more terrifying possibilities of what these early technology prototypes will evolve into. For example, killing individuals or wiping out large groups using a remote control in the hands of a single individual thousands of miles away is already a ghastly reality. One that people in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Palestine, and Iraq know all too well. There are even examples in the United States, or at least one, where police have used a drone to kill a suspect. The capabilities of artificial intelligence for facial recognition, for example, make it conceivable and easy to selectively wipe out whole ethnic groups. And this is just the technology that currently exists. The promises of this technology to utterly subdue whole populations and preclude meaningful resistance should truly alarm us all. And it underscores why this conversation is so important. I come from one of the most surveilled people on the planet. Literally, there are multiple cameras in every corner of Arab Jerusalem. Spy drones fly over every inch of Gaza and the West Bank, monitoring and recording movements of Palestinians, however curtailed they are by the Israeli military already. Imposing a settler Jewish state on Palestine against the will of its indigenous Palestinian people is perhaps the last vestige of European colonialism, or at least settler colonialism, which spanned centuries, stretched over the majority of our planet, 
and set in motion the quandary we find ourselves in now. It is important, I think, to acknowledge and attempt to remedy these roots of our current human predicament, rather than merely focus on tempering its most recent manifestations, such as the Ukraine crisis or even climate change. History for the past several centuries has been shaped by Western values and economic structures that are predicated on boundless extraction, violent exploitation of humans and animals, plundering and polluting of our planet, rapacious consumption, prioritization of profit above all, and the utter disregard and disrespect for ecological systems that sustain life. Western leadership has indeed moved humanity as far away as possible from having a symbiotic relationship with the natural world. And instead, they have ordered human life in such a way that makes our existence parasitic, even for the most intentional of us, who no matter how hard we try, have no other viable options than to take part in these destructive systems if we simply want to maintain social connections, work, and secure food sustenance. We are being pushed toward what Richard described as an uninhabitable earth, and we're getting there with or without an acute, the acute harm of a nuclear winter. There tends to be popular belief that we're simply operating out of so-called human nature, but that's the biggest lie. There are thousands of examples of human societies that have lived symbiotically with their surroundings. Nearly all of these examples are found among indigenous peoples or those who, live, who otherwise live close to the land with deep affinity and reverence for it and a real appreciation for our dumb luck to be visitors and witnesses to its magnificence, its biodiversity and its mysteries. Whatever strategies we use to deal with the crisis in Ukraine or Taiwan or, other, or elsewhere, there has to be another layer and intention in our actions to dismantle the current capitalist order. It is not likely to happen in our lifetimes, but the seeds must be planted now to disseminate the knowledge that capitalism is not inevitable. Economic disparity, food insecurity, and war are not and must not continue to be accepted as normal consequences of social structures. Rather, everything we do must reveal to the next generations <clears throat> that the systems we are born under were designed by ruling elites who implemented education systems to produce obedient workers, who promoted social principles that measure the worth of individuals by how much resources they can hoard from others, who've normalized obscene consumption, who've legalized imperial wars and plunder, and who've littered our lives with distractions and fears and false dreams that shape and manipulate public imagination and thought. In the greater aim of creating a more equitable and symbiotic world, one that is predicated on indigenous no notions that we are not owners, but fortunate guests who get to be here for a time to live in parallel with other nations, both human and non-human nations. We should ensure that the immediate interventions in Ukraine do not totally defeat or humiliate Russia, no matter what we think of Russians, Russia's actions because we cannot afford to continue to live in this violent unipolar world order where the United States has free, free hand to launch imperial assaults on weaker nations to steal their natural resources and open up more docile and captive markets for US corporations. The destruction of Iraq, and I don't want to call it a war because it most certainly was not, will take hundreds of years to repair, though that ancient civiliz civilization will likely never recover what the US plundered of its treasures and its radians. The same can be said of Libya, of Syria, Palestine, Yemen, and a multitude of South American and African nations. 
there is a better, kinder way to exist. And it must begin in our imaginations. Many before us have pondered these questions and did their best to create remedies. The establishment of the United Nations is a primary example of such efforts. And while there are many examples of successes <clears throat> through the United Nations that have led to incremental justice, we know that the UN has failed to on the most important task of holding to account those who are truly powerful. Or worse, it has and continues to bestow legitimacy to hegemonic violence and looting. <clears throat> it remains, however, a system within which change is possible. I don't want to suggest otherwise, but I believe that we should not continue to put all our faith in top-down systems. Rather, we should focus on popular resistance on promoting, institutionalizing, expanding, and protecting access and the ability of peoples to organize resistance and revolution. Because that is truly the only space from which every meaningful moral advancement and social correction has emerged. Thank you. Susan, thank you so much uh, for such beautiful and inspiring words. Um, I love that uh, you said that uh, a better world must begin in our imaginations. Um, we are running short on time, so I'm going to go right to Victoria Britton, um, our last discussant. Uh, Victoria is a British journalist and author who has lived and worked in many uh, places over many years in Africa, the US and Asia. Um, and she has worked uh, for 20 years at The Guardian, where she eventually uh, became the associate foreign editor in the 80s. She worked closely with the anti-apartheid movement, interviewing activists from the United Democratic Front and the so Southern African Liberation Movements. Uh, Victoria, I am going to just give the floor to you um, without further ado. Victoria, you're muted. Okay, let me start again by saying thank you very much, um, Ivana, um, and thank you and all the other panelists for their wise words on, on many, many fronts, which I agree with. Um, I'm saying good afternoon from London, and it's an amazing honor for me to be part of this webinar and with this panel. And I want my contribution to be in memory of the great peace campaigner and my friend Bruce Kent. Earlier this year, we spoke together in Trafalgar Square in London for peace and the opening of talks between Ukraine and Russia at the moment when the entire political class in Britain enthusiastically backed war as the way forward to cripple Russia. An imitation from Asia is very special to me. I was born in India, and my first exposure to the deep issues we're confronting here was in Asia, when I took myself and my small son uh, to Saigon during the American war destroying South Vietnam. I wanted to be a journalist who saw and described the horror of that war. But it was decades later when I understood how much I didn't see. I'll give you one example. The major war crime when the US dropped $19 million gallons of Agent Orange poison onto Vietnam and 600,000 gallons of the more deadly Agent Purple on Laos, a country internationally recognized as neutral. Now today, more than 50 years later, children with rare and terrible birth defects are still being born to the grandchildren of the villagers who suffered the first American action there. Just like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
Vietnam's war crimes by the Americans can never be forgotten. And I think our humanity depends on the refusal of normalizing war. War does not, as our leaders like to tell us, bring peace, freedom, and justice. Ask any Yemeni, Iraqi, Libyan, or Afghan today. And I agree with everybody who said that civil society in its many forms is the only hope for campaigning against today's wars and today's organization of our world. And the justice that we want means accountability. Let me give one target, the world's arms industry. That's worth 531 billion. And it's dominated by the United States with 56% of it. This arms industry has captured lawmakers in countries across the world with their lobbying and their bribes. They distort government spending priorities for what really matters from everything that's been said on climate change, which threatens the existence of our very planet and on the dismantling of nuclear armaments. Plus, of course, the distortion of not doing the spending we need on education and health, which will be what transforms the next generation's capacity to remake our society, which I believe they will. Only confident, educated civil society can end the American embrace of a gun culture, which pretends that guns bring safety. As we all know, in America, this culture brings random death on the street, especially if you're black, and is turning American schools into fortresses. And worse, Americans' liberal access to guns has opened up frontiers to a gun smuggling industry across its southern border, which has turned parts of Central and South America into open season for gun deaths linked to the gun trade and drug trade and organized crime. Ask all those def desperate refugees, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico on the US border. And barbarism is the word I want to use for the realities we live today, even beyond the wars. Let me just name some examples. State torture, kidnapping, assassinations, bombings of civilians, occupying of countries such as Palestine, which Susan just mentioned, for decades, plus the growing economic inequality that others have mentioned. All of this is now normalized in the practices of the most powerful country on the planet and it's copied on every continent. And this includes the routine practice of lying and the creation of gross misinformation and manipulation of truth by political leaders, which has so deeply, deeply damaged democracy. For the first time, we're living in a world where according to UNHCR, 100 million people have been forcibly displaced by the linked issues of climate change and war for which the key responsibilities lie with Western government's policy choices. And it will be worse. The IOM has predicted that by 2050, 1.5 billion people will be forced from their homes by heat and drought. And today with total impunity, Western governments are ignoring international law on refugees as well as on so much else. The Mediterranean Sea is a graveyard as Europe repels refugees with boats and walls and armies and payments to Libya, Niger and Turkey to keep refugees out of Europe. Australia imprisoned refugees on remote islands. The UK government is fighting its own judiciary to fly them to Central Africa. Guantanamo Bay has to be mentioned here and the other US secret prisons from Asia to Europe because they symbolize how international law has been scorned. A complete lack of accountability in the US war on terror began 20 years ago. It was the order under which we lived then and which we live now. The prisoners are still held, trials stalled by a mockery of law, and the torturers, the lawyers, and the politicians who gave those orders, they flourish today in America. But the crimes will not be forgotten by history. So what we need now on every continent is a society which is informed enough at the grassroots for action to transform our limping democracies into a planetary civilization 
and thus change the world. And I want to say that women's leadership is absolutely essential for this. Some seeds of new kind of journalism, essential journalism, lie in multiple strands of citizen journalism across the world, challenging the misinformation of the much mainstream media. And mostly this is initiated by the young generation that I so deeply believe in. I believe too that artists of all ages and disciplines are very powerful vectors of dissent and pointers towards a different place. And as I indicated earlier, the education for the next generations has to be the central platform of hope and power for the future. I want to end with the words of a great British thinker of the 20th century, Raymond Williams. This is what he wrote. To be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. Hope is the most important gift that this call and everything that comes out of it can offer the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. Uh, thank you uh, for your beautiful words. Uh, thank you for your important reminders um, about the, the power of the military industry, about uh, the role of women. Uh, I, I really feel inspired. I think it's very easy to see we're about three minutes from the end of the program. I think it's very easy to see that this is truly just the beginning. Um, we have all heard so much, um, and I regret that we will not actually have time for discussion, but I think the conclusion is a very simple one, that we have to do this again. Uh, we have to do this uh, so the next time we can engage, uh, uh, have engagement between the panelists, and then we can, so it's going to be a part two. I don't, I think Hassan Al has not approved, but I, I think a part two is going to have to be organized. Um, and, and so we can also engage with the audience. There were some really uh, wonderful remarks uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, lots of support, obviously, for what's happening and what people are hearing. Um, and also some suggestions for how this can be broadened. I'm just going to really call on everyone uh, who is here to share this webinar recording, to share the call, to ask uh, their friends, uh, family, acquaintances, um, to sign the petition and to really engage. And I think we can go for that goal, uh, Professor Muzaffar's goal for 5,000 <laughs> uh, people on the petition in another month and, and perhaps another, a part two of this session so we can have more discussion and more engagement. Um, I'm personally so grateful to have just been a part of all of this. It was truly an honor to hear from everybody. Um, and I'm just going to pass it to Hassan Al in case he wanted to make any um, last uh, uh, comments. Um, I think uh, it's, I think it's okay uh, with the closing remarks, uh, Ivana. Um, in that regard, I suppose, uh, I know there were many questions that were asked during the session itself. Uh, and I wanted to actually, before we end, uh, Prof. Joe, uh, Dr. Chandra, Richard, I believe, uh, is it okay if we end the session here? Or would we want to carry on with a bit of the question? Because there were some very good questions, and I did save them for when we want to, if we want to do a second session some other time. Uh, any of your inputs, Dr. Chandra? <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Hasano. <clears throat> we will certainly want to do a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth in a session, this is to go on. I was thinking of a situation where if I think of the discussions, I think each of them developed, uh, deserve a platform by themselves and they deserve to put across their views and interact with people because the issues that they raised were really very, very important. I must say as um, one of the three initiators of this, as Joe and Richard will testify, we had a, quite a bit of struggle trying to get discussions and so on. 
But you know what has happened, you know, Joe and Richard, it's just amazing. I have hardly attended a session like this where there is such rich sharing. There is so much depth. There is such um, insight, understanding of not just the immediate crisis, but the crisis at its very roots. And to be able to do all that within the seven minutes allocated to each of the discussants, I think is a great achievement. Yeah, what it shows is we need to continue this. And maybe we'll have to develop the techniques of communication more effectively. And like what Joe said, we'll have to do this in other languages. When I know that uh, Triwak does work in, in the Thai language, and the others I'm sure who use their own languages, including perhaps Susan and you know, perhaps the others, myself, you know, we've got different backgrounds. If we can bring all these writings and contributions together and um, disseminate this information. I would say that we should translate the call immediately into Malay and perhaps into Thai and perhaps into Chinese and uh, Russian and other languages if we can. We will try to do this. This is one of our pledges and we'll keep in touch with everyone. And I'm sure my colleagues have things to say so I make three pledges as an individual in this group. Number one is the process will continue. And we would want individuals involved in this, and this means beyond the three initiators, all the other individuals, we want them to play prominent roles, right to be in the forefront. We want them to also help to mobilize and to disseminate and all the rest of it. And um, at the same time, translations into various languages because one of the critiques that people have made about alternative movements is that in some places they tend to be very Anglo-Saxon in terms of you know, the English language orientation and so on. We have to bring in other languages, we have to do that sort of work. And most of all, I think we have to create clusters in different parts of the world, which operate on their own and yet communicate with one another. These things have been tried, they have not worked, but with the new, channels of communication, but more than the new channels of communi communication, what I think will propel this sort of movements in the future is the crisis of moment, the danger that we face, us, that we face. This is why I think people will respond because they know that they are at a very, very difficult moment in history. And that is very often brought about great changes. You look at the nationalist movements and movements against apartheid and so on. Likewise, I think our movement, the moment we are at, is going to be the main propeller, the driving force behind the transformation that we see. Thank you. Thank you, Darshana. And so um, with that, uh, I believe we can call and draw this uh, webinar to a close. For everyone who wants to follow further updates, you can follow the call on the change.org petition. All further updates will also be posted on there, including the link to this particular webinar recording as well. So uh, with that, I want to first and, first and foremost thank uh, Ivana for moderating the entire session. It was wonderful to have you. And to each of our speakers, Dr. Chandra, Richard, and of Joe, Thank you for coming and joining us. And also to Victoria Britton, Susan Abuhawa, and Professor Chaiwan. Thank you for joining us today. And we hope that this call will continue forward and we will hopefully see you all again. So with that, thank you very much, everyone. And to all the audiences, thank you for your questions. We will definitely have a second session most likely after this as well. So thank you for your questions and we hope to see you all again. Thank you very much. So much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.